All right, everybody, welcome to another edition. All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of uh, Live Learn from the Pros. Today, we are talking about all things digital. So we're going to give everybody a minute to get in. And um, once we have some people in, we're going to go ahead and get started. So, um, yeah, I want to remind everybody who's watching this video, whether or not you're watching right now, or if you're watching later on, go ahead and check out my website, jasonreynoldsproaudio.com. Um, it is in the description of this video, so go ahead and do that. And then second of all, um, if you're looking for audio training, um, we do master classes bi-weekly on Tuesdays. Uh, we just had a master class this past Tuesday. Um, we actually have an extra one this month um, that's coming up on Tuesday. Drew Keys is coming back to do an Ableton Masterclass. So that is going to be live on Tuesday coming. Um, so check out patreon.com slash Jason Reynolds Pro Audio um, to, to view that. I want to thank our sponsors um, who make these live learn from the pros possible so um yeah gear audio digital are two of our sponsors um gear audio is obviously the canadian distributor for digital consoles and dpa you heard from jeff yesterday he was covering dpa and today you're gonna get to hear from me um i'm gonna talk to you about why i like digital consoles why i use digital consoles and what sets them apart so today is an introduction and then we will have a master class an in-depth um digital masterclass training um which is sd series advanced training uh through our masterclass setup so thanks again for joining if you have questions definitely drop it in the comments i'll try today to take as many questions as possible um we do have a little bit more freedom we don't have any guests today it's just me doing the presentation so we have a little bit more freedom to be able to take questions and stuff so going to try our best to um, make sure that we take as many questions as possible. So drop drop a comment. Let me know where you're tuning in for from. Let me know who's all tuning in today. I'm pretty excited to go through this and get started. If you're all ready to go, let us get started. And then for those watching afterwards, definitely feel free to comment, message me if you have questions. Um, if you need more information, I'm going to go through some links afterwards so that you can get more digital training. I will also be shooting um, two segments for the Locked Up With A Digital um, segment. They've been posting those on Instagram and Facebook. I believe it's on Facebook as well. But I will be, um, I'll be shooting a couple segments for them um, as soon as I'm finished live here today, um, shooting a few, a few segments for, for Locked Up With A Digital. So... Um, yeah, let's get into it. Let's talk about Digical. Um, in my opinion, the number one console manufacturer for live sound currently. Um, it, for a number of reasons, um, Digical is, is, is probably the most widely used console. Um, but they're also using Digital consoles on most of the major um, shows, especially shows going live to TV, the Super Bowl, uh, the Grammy Awards, the Oscars. Um, you'll find a digital console at the helm of those shows. I've been a digital user now for about eight years. Um, I used to, my console of choice prior to that was a Midas Pro 2. Prior to the Midas was the, um, was, was the, the Avid Profile and uh, made the switch to di digital and ha I've never, never looked back. Um, both, yeah, they, they locked up with the digital. I will post to the Patreon site as well. Um, but if you don't follow digital, you should definitely go ahead and, and, and follow them. Um, my main reason for switching to digital when I first made the switch was reliability. Um, I was having a lot of problems with my Midas, and, and so I made the decision to switch to digital. And like I said, I haven't, I haven't looked back. Um, took a little bit for me to learn the console at first. The reason why I didn't switch sooner was the learning curve was a little um, intimidating to me at first at the time, um, since I'd been working on a profile for so long, I was so used to the profile. But like I said, once I made the switch, once I learned the console with the incredible support from the guys at Gear Audio, I haven't looked back in eight years and I'm still still um, uh, an avid digital user. It's the number one console on my, um, on my rider. 
my console of choice. So let's get into it. Special thanks to Gear Audio, of course. Um, they're the reason why I'm able to do these. Um, they've trained me and they've been a great support to me. So thanks to Gear Audio and all the guys at Gear, Jeff, um, Peter, Bob Snellgrove, Ian Roberts, and everybody at Gear Audio. I want to send a huge shout out to them. Um, Danny and Scott, definitely everybody at Gear. Um, they've been a great support. So thank, thanks to them. Um, so our goals through today's presentation is simple. Um, we want to introduce you to the core technologies. We want you to understand what, what is at the heart of a digital console, what makes it tick, what makes it special. Um, we definitely want to go through the hardware, give you an overview of the hardware, um, the digital audio protocols that, that can be used along with the console. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about session management. won't go into much detail on session management. That will be in our advanced, our, our advanced training. Um, we, we're going to talk a little bit about the interface and the operation of the console, um, best practices, and then, and then we'll sort of open up for questions. So uh, technology and system architecture is very important. So in terms of how the console works is you got a control surface, you got audio ports, right? But in between that, there's a PC at the, at the base of the console, in, in, at the foundation of the console, if you will. And there's obviously an audio engine that controls your audio, your um, analog to digital and your digital to analog conversion. So the control surface talks to the PC, the audio ports talk to the audio engine, and the PC talks to the audio engine, right? That's how it all ties together. Um, so it, it's very important, I think, to understand how a console works, because if you do ever have problems, then in order to troubleshoot it, you need to understand how the flow of information takes place. So this kind of this slide gives you a quick understanding of how that works. The control surface is essentially like a mouse, a mouse and keyboard for the PC. Um, and then the audio ports convert analog audio to digital and transfer that to the audio engine so that the PC can... Um, can can interpret that um, and uh, and of course most people watching this have some sort of a foundation in audio and understand digital audio you understand it's converting an analog electrical signal into ones and zeros um, which which is referenced in the bitrate of 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 a console so um, yeah definitely understanding how that flow of information happens is very important so at the base of, of, of the Digico is, at the core of the Digico, if you will, is the FPGA audio engine. So, so let's t take a little bit of a look at FPGA and what sets it, sets it apart. So a lot of digital consoles, if you're familiar with the Avid, with the Midas, they work on multiple DSPs. So um, you have multiple digital signal processors that you combine essentially to make one console, right? Um, in order to make them work together, you have this glue logic that's needed um, to get all your DSP um, working together. It, it consists of larger and multiple PCBs. Um, it's way more complicated. It uses way more power consumption. Um, and it's less reliable than newer technologies. So if you think of Avid, for those of you who are who are familiar with the Avid consoles, for example, um, you could have not all Avid profiles were, were, were the same because you could have a profile that had three mix engines, three DSP engines, or you could go all the way up to five. And, and the amount of processing and plugins that you could run on, on a profile was dependent on how many DSP cards um, were loaded into, into that system. So that's, that's the most common which is the dsp technology but the the super fpga chip and why fpga is it's less power consumption it boots up way faster um and 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 if you've and and this is definitely not to bash any other console i want to make that clear this is really just to 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 show you why i choose digital if you've ever stood and waited for a an S6L or a, or a profile to boot up it seems like an eternity especially if um there's a shutdown and, and technology does fail. So this is not to say that you never will have a problem with a digital console, but if you ever had to reboot one, it's gonna boot way faster than a, a console that uses DSP technology. It's way more reliable, um, no glue logic needed because everything is, in, is on one motherboard. Um, that's going back to the one PCB, it's one motherboard. 
right? It's easily scalable. So um, the 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 current um, FPGA technology and what they're using, they're only using a fraction of each FPGA chip in the console. So they can easily scale that for years to come as the I.O. requirements in the console become bigger and bigger. And we're going to get into FB, FPGA a little bit more. But um, yeah, it's easily, easily scalable. Um, there's no third party hard hardware or software for large I.O. count. The large I.O. count is, is handled right internally in the FPGA chip. There's direct access to all the I.O. inputs and outputs. Um, there's nearly unlimited headroom in processing, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there's the ability to, to add future updates and upgrades, and like, like I mentioned before, it's future-proof. So very important that you understand this. So if we look at where FPGA technology has come from five years ago, in terms of the space that it would take to handle versus now, if you look at this, this is what the same amount of information um, space-wise on an FPGA motherboard compared to now. They, they have completely streamlined that technology and, and you can handle way more information and processing in one, in, in one chip and one space and one smaller space. So if we take a look at the technology, just how fast is fast? Um, because you want to, this is important as an audio engineer using a digital console, um, there's a few things that matter. Um, analog to digital conversion is very important. And then digital to analog conversion is very important. But somewhere in the middle, the conversation of latency arises. And, and latency is very important. Um, so if you look here, um, and let me, let me get you here. If you look at the leading competitors, okay, which is A, B, C, and D, they'll remain nameless. But actually one of them, I will say B, is actually the previous um, digital 24-bit cards, um, but if you look at the 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 most recent and and for those of you who follow me, I'll let you take a guess at which one D is. Um, but if you look at latency at 96k, meaning time it takes from analog to digital conversion and digital back to analog conversion, so that's what we're looking at here. That latency on the FPGA chips is the lowest in the industry. It beats anything out there considerably. And it's at 0 0.89 milliseconds at 96K. Um, so, so I want everybody to understand, those who follow me and know that I've been so avidly, um, <laughs> no pun intended, avidly a digital user, this is why. Um, latency matters and, and latency creates and, and, and allows you to not create problems, especially for me as a monitor engineer. Latency is, is one of your worst nightmares as a monitor engineer. Now, why is that latency so important to be as low as possible passing through the chip? As you add processing, whether you be using outboard processing or you're using onboard processing, as you add processing, it increase your, increases your latency. So imagine if you're on a console that is at 2.83 milliseconds um, of latency even before you add anything when you start to add processing in there you're going to notice you're going to have significant latency issues which you now have to get into doing stuff like timing inputs and stuff that you wouldn't normally have to think about if you're using a console that works on the the new 32-bit io right which is which is incredibly important um so having industry-leading technology is really what has set digico apart for a very long time now, if we look at the next line, um, the THD plus N, this is actually distortion plus signal to noise ratio at one kilohertz at zero dBFS, right? Um, which I, th I believe on these consoles is minus 18 um, dB. It works out to be zero dB, dBFS on digital consoles. The, the, the distortion and signal to noise at 1K is way less, I mean, significantly less than even the previous 24-bit cards. It's just significantly less. And then the dynamic range, digital D to A dynamic range is at 120 dBU. And the average noise, digital to analog, um, 
is is minus 98 and for for other consoles have not been measured so so give it up for digi digital for for really really creating and and creating technology that you can count on and depend on as an audio engineer and and why I think you should really consider um implementing these these um these these consoles into your workflow for sure so let's talk about a little bit about the this is the SD7 quantum engine that's what you're looking at here um that's one super F FPGA chip, and that handles all your core routing, um, buses, and matrix. And the cool thing about FPGA chips is that you now can have multiple chips really effectively and efficiently handling what your console is doing. So you've got super FPGA 1, 2, and 3 is handling all your channel processing and nodal processing. Um, what nodal processing is, for those of you who may not join us for the advanced class because we're going to go through advanced um, the nodal processing in the advanced class. I do have a quantum 338 that's at the centerpiece of my teaching studio. So we'll be able to take a look at um, the quantum processing, uh, although to a lesser extent than the SD7, the 338 does have um, quantum processing in it, um, just a little bit less obviously because the price of it is um, way less compared to a, a SD7 Quantum. Um, so your FPGA, Super FPGA 2 and 3 is handling your channel and nodal processing. Now it still has Shark, X-Sharks, which, which are DSP um, engines that handle um, your FX processing and FPGA control coprocessor. And the reason why that is, is they handle anything to do with time, anything that has time involved, um, which is FX delays and reverb and stuff, they handle those a little bit more efficiently. But it's still on one motherboard, less chance of failure. No, again, we talked about no glue logic needed. So if you look at the rest of the engine, um, you've got the engine host ARM processor, OptiCore, which is built into every quantum engine. Um, eight MADI ports on the SD7, six MADI ports, three redundant ports on the Quantum 338. You've got a word clock um, input and output. There's, a, there's video sync and also AES sync on MADI ports. And then you've got a built-in UB MADI. So what the UB MADI is, which we'll talk about a little bit later in detail, is a MADI interface that is able to carry 48 channels bidirectionally at 48K. So you've got a built-in UB MADI. So with by just plugging in a USB printer-style USB cable, um, you can get 48 channels um, over at 48K just with a cable right into your laptop. No need for anything external, no external interfaces. So supported digital audio formats. Um, Digico supports AES-3, AES-10 over MADI. Um, AES-42, AES-67, Dante, Hydra-2, we support AVM through an AVM card. Most of these are through cards. Um, the Mi personal mixing system, the ME system is the Allen and Heath personal mixing system. Wave sound grid, of course, OptiCore and HDSDI. Um, supported integrations currently is um, Waves is integrated into the console. Elisa, which is spatial um, processing from L Acoustics, which again, we'll talk about a little bit later. Clang, Clang is integrated and controllable from the console. Um, this presentation was done prior to the Clang DMI card coming out. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit, but um, I'm kind of let you know how the DMI card um, works and the differences. So all of this is supported integration wise into um into the console so let's talk about the hardware let's go over the hardware a little bit and i, I want to keep moving through this because i want to make sure we have um as much time so there's two sections we got to look at we got to look at first the s series so the s series is a little bit um more i guess i guess lower budget um it, it's the same great digico sound um and the cool thing about digico i think is that no matter the control surface, all the control surfaces have the capability to work with any of the stage racks um, that Digico makes. So we'll talk about that a little bit. But the S-Series, um, we, we sell a lot of S-Series consoles to churches, um, smaller venues. 
It's a fantastic console. The S21 is a small format digital mixing console. It does 48 flexi inputs. What that means is any input on the console can be either mono or stereo. So um, a stereo channel does not have to take up an, an, an additional fader, nor does it have to take up an additional processing path. So you could on this console do 48 stereo channels. That's pretty cool. At, at this price range, I, I highly doubt there's any other console um, that does it at the price range. It has 16 flexi buses. Again, those can be mono or stereo. And those buses can be either be groups or auxes. They, they can be either or. It has a left and right stereo master group, uh, two mono or stereo solo buses. So um, the, the two solo buses is important if you're using monitors, um, especially because if you have a combination of wedges and in-ears, then you can have one solo bus driving your in-ears and one solo bus driving your wedges. Um, so you can basically, you, you can basically, um, when you're soloing an in-ear mix, you have it go to one solo bus and it doesn't come out the Q wedge and vice versa. Okay. Local inputs and outputs on the console. It has 24 mic or line analog inputs. It has 12 analog outputs. So if you need less than 24 inputs and 12 outputs, you can run the console without using an, ex ex an external rack. Um, it's got 24 mic or line inputs right on the console. Um, it has a pair of AES inputs and a pair of outputs, which is one XLR jack does carries two AES inputs and outputs. It has two DMI slots, and we'll talk a little bit about DMI after, so you know what that is. I know if you're not familiar with the digital infrastructure, you might have a question about that, but we will cover that. And it has 21 motorized touch-sensitive faders. Um, so you've got 10 faders in each bank. Let me put on my laser pointer so you can see. Um, 10 faders in each bank, and then a master, a master fader here right um and it's it also has the integrated ub maddie um with sample rate conversion so if you're running a channel at 96 if you're running a, a session sorry at 96k and you want to use the ub maddie for recording the ub maddie automatically does sample rate conversion so it won't record at 96k it'll record at 48k but you will still get all 48 channels um from the record it has the built-in sample rate conversion so let's take a look at the back of the console um, that's what the back of the console looks like um, it, it's got built-in network ports as well so these are your network ports here if you can see it it's got word clock input it has an output a dvi for an external monitor and these are your aes here The S31, which is the, the slightly bigger brother of the S21, um, not much difference to what the console is capable of, or, or no difference to what the console is capable of doing. The only difference is that the S31 has an extra bank of 10 faders. So instead of 21 motorized faders, you now get 31 in the S31 series console. Now, I've, I've actually toured with an S21 at monitors with Shaggy. Um, we did a, 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 I think it was three week run of the US some years ago. And at the time we didn't have a big budget for production. So we brought out a pair of S21s and it worked fantastically for the entire tour. Um, so great console, um, you're not sacrificing any sound. Um, it sounds the same, like I say, it interfaces with any of the racks that Digical makes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, yeah, so Danny, I see your question. I, I, I guess I just answered that. So, um, sample rate conversion is built in again, the back of the S 31 very, it's exactly the same as the S 21. So the only difference again is the additional bank of faders. So after we get out of the S series, we move into the S D series consoles, um, which people always ask about the console numbers. I I really don't have the the answer 
<laughs> for for console numbers and why they are a little bit confusing but i will definitely talk about the different consoles so with the stealth core 2 which nowadays if you're buying a a, a, a sd series console um i don't think gear audio will sell you a console that doesn't have core 2 so we're gonna focus on core 2 so let's start start with the sd 11i which we'll go into in detail 80 input channels on a SD11. Now, these aren't flexi channels. The only time we refer to flexi channels is on the S series. So it's very important to note that on the SD series, a fader can be made into, into stereo and still only take up one fader, but it will still use two channel paths. So it will take two out of your 80, right? So when it says 80 on SD series, it doesn't mean that you can do 80 stereo channels. It's a it's a little bit different. Um, it's a little bit different um, from from the S series. Um, David, I see your question. Why it's called SD? SD is what they had long before the S series came after the SD series. Um, the S series was kind of digital releasing a console that could be a little bit. In a, in a little bit smaller price bracket um, for those people who couldn't necessarily get up to the, the price of an SD console. And they've been, they been actually very, very popular and, and successful in that market space. Um, the SD11, and, and this is kind of a snapshot. I, the, the, the slide presentation goes into each, um, ch each console individually and what it does. But this is kind of your SD lineup. So you've got SD11i, SD9, which is the next step. Then you have SD12, SD8, SD10, SD5CS, and SD5. So the difference between the SD5CS and the 5 is that the CS doesn't carry optical, um, and it has it it has a little bit different um, capability from an I/O standpoint, um, but it's the same control surface basically, right? So, and then you have the SD7 Quantum, and of course, you have now the new Quantum 338, which sits somewhere in here. Um, so the, the Quantum 338 sort of sits somewhere in between the SD12 and the SD5. Um, sort of a replacer for the SD8 and 10, if you will. So that's sort of the lineup. I'm just checking for questions. The piano roll operation. Um, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. Is that with the S series, Danny? And Bo says for the for the flexi inputs on the S21, you said 48 flexi um, inputs, so 96 mono inputs possible. No, so 96 mono inputs are not possible. Um, you can do 96 physical inputs if you're combining them into 48 stereo channels. So, but you can't have 96 mono channels. The channels either are mono or stereo, but they can be 48 stereo. Okay, I don't, I'm not sure why exactly you would want 48 stereo, but you get what I'm saying. All right, so digital co versus competition. And this is important, again, because this is just me explaining to you guys why I use digital consoles, right? Um, digital and Opticore is Opticore is capable of 504 audio paths per loop. And, it, and the consoles that carry optical usually carry two optical loops. So you're able to do, you're able to do um, 1,008 total audio paths on one desk, right? That's phenomenal because if you're looking at AVB, you're looking at a max of 192 by 120. Um, and then the Yamaha twin lane is 256 in, 256 out. So by far, for if you're doing large input shows, the way you want to go is digital and OptiCore for sure. Um, on a shared network, you can have five pr primary consoles and redundant engines um, versus two on AVB and two on, on Yamaha. That's the reason why um, in a lot of cases like the Grammy Awards, the Oscars, where they have multiple desks, sharing inputs and stage racks you it it's 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 easier and and you're capable of doing this on a digital console whereas you you'd be limited with the other console infrastructure of the comp, um, competition 
right? You can have up to 14 racks and devices per optical loop. So that's 28 racks and devices in total. So if you think about a large venue that may have, um, or, or a broadcast situation that may have input boxes all over the place, that is certainly, ca you're certainly capable of doing that in the digital space, right? Uh, Multimode fiber is, is able to run up to 350 meters, which I think is close to a thousand feet. Um, which is single mode fiber is is capable of hundreds of kilometers no fi single mode fiber not available for for avid avb so on large shows um this makes a big difference all right so let's talk about the sd11 it's a small format digital mixing console um, it does 48 input channels 80 with the injection option uh does 24 output buses um local local inputs and outputs it has 16 mic or line analog inputs eight analog outputs and a pair of aes and in and out um, it does one cat 5e interface for the remote d for a remote d rack but it also has one bnc madi connection um, 12 motorized touch sensitive faders um, integrated rack rails so you can rack mount this um, optional optocore you can get optional optocore or Waves I.O. with it. So take a look at the back. Um, that's the back of the console, heavy duty power supply with fan. Um, it's a little bit more pro grade than, than the S series stuff. Okay, the step up from the SD11 is the SD9, um, which is a medium format digital mixing console. This is what I have at the church where I'm technical director, my church faith sanctuary. We have an SD9 console, so it's, got, it's capable of 96 input channels, 48 um, output buses. In terms of local inputs and outputs, it has eight mic line analog um, inputs. The price line point on the 11, I am not 100% sure. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Brian, I would have to, I haven't priced out a, a, a 11 in a long time, but I can certainly find out and let you know if you send me an email. Um, SD9, so the, like I was saying, this is what we have at Faith Sanctuary. Um, 96 input channels, 48 output channels. Um, it's got eight mic line analog inputs um, locally on the desk. It's also has eight analog line outputs on the desk. It has two pairs of AES inputs, so four um, channels of AES inputs and outputs on the console. It has two CAT5e interfaces, so you can run either two DRACs at 48K or one DRAC at 96K if you're using CAT5. Um, it has one BNC MADI connection as well on top of the two cat five and we're going to talk a little bit later about things you can do in the digital line um yeah david the the the, the numbers are a bit confusing but um yeah um it's got 24 motorized touch sensitive faders in two banks so you have a bank over here and a bank over here okay um, and it does have the optional OptiCore and Waves I.O. as well. So that's the back of the desk, more commonly referred to as the red snapper. Inputs at the top, outputs at the bottom. And it's got dual power supply. So that's, that's also very important here. Now that we're up into the SD9, we get dual power supplies. This is the SD12 which is, um, was, I, I should say, was my favorite um, control surface until the 338, the Quantum 338 came out. Um, the, the reason why I like the SD12 a lot is the screens were more upright, so you didn't have to lean over the console as much. It was a different design to the, to, to the previous family of SD series consoles, which were kind of more of a flat design. Um, this was more upright, so there's two good things about that is, is um, you had the, the, the ability to um, see it better in the daytime. 
um, but also it was a little bit or ergon it's a little bit more ergonomic when you're sitting down or, or even standing and mixing just you can reach things a lot easier so this is the SD12 it's 72 input channels or 96 with the SD12 96 upgrade which is an additional I think if you're in Canada um, it's about twenty four hundred dollars um, to, to go up to 96 which I think you should do if you're buying this console it's got 36 output buses or 48 with the upgrade again local inputs and outputs it's got eight of each um, but four pairs of AES um, inputs and outputs it has two BNC MADI connections built in um, 24 plus 2 motorized touch sensitive faders but it's got two DMI slots so what you'll notice now is the new family of consoles going from the SD12 to the Quantum 338 to the Quantum 5 engine and then the Quantum 7 engine all ha carry DMI slots and we'll talk a little bit about why that's important coming up um, that's the back of the SD12 the SD8 um, is 120 input channels, 48 output buses. Same amount of analog mic line inputs, um, but it's got 36 faders plus one master fader, um, or assignable fader rather, um, most commonly used as a master fader. Two BNC MADI connections, but it's got optional optocore I.O. as well as Waves I.O. It's the back of the SD8. SD8 also comes in a 24 um, fader version for those who still need the I.O. of the SD8 but have a smaller footprint space. This is the SD10, also very popular, 144 input channels, 64 output, output buses. Um, nothing's changed for the local inputs and outputs. Um, two BNC MADI connections, uh, 36 plus one motorized touch sensitive faders, and of course, Waves IO is standard and optional optocore with the SD10. That's the back of the SD10. And again, SD10 also comes in a 24 fader version for those who need the IO of, of the SD10, but don't have the footprint to house the entire surface. Um, this is the rack mount redundant engine for the SD10. I have never seen one of these in person, so I, I, I won't spend too much time on it, but it's available. Um, so large format digital mixing consoles. Um, this is the SD5. The SD5 is capable of 253 input channels, up to 128 output buses. Um, prior to the Quantum 338 and the 12, this was actually my favorite surface, mainly because um, it, the 10 macro buttons would be right above the center section. So for mixing, it was really, really convenient when mixing front of house, having the macros right here. Um, so I was a big fan of that. Um, local inputs and outputs continuous, the same. Four BNC MADI connections. 36 plus one again, motorized touch sensitive faders. Waves IO standard. Um, and it's got optional optocore I.O. both first and second loop. That's the back of the desk. And then the SD7 Quantum, um, or the SD7, which is the flagship console, 253 processing channels, up to 253 input channels, um, up to 128 output buses, um, local inputs and outputs, 12 analog, um, mic line analog inputs, 12 analog outputs. It got six pairs of AES inputs and outputs, uh, four BNC MADI connections. Uh, this one has 48 plus four um, motorized touch sensitive faders. And if you notice, if you're looking, um, if you've never seen an SD7 in person, it's got an additional bank of faders um, above the center section. And it's got two sets of the um, assignable faders which are commonly used for master faders um, I will cover macros in my advanced training so I I, um, I see that question Bo but you're already a part of our master classes so I will cover 
macros. Um, macros are essentially assignable, so they can be used for anything. Most commonly assigned for tap tempo and saving your file, a quick quick button to save your file, for example. And of course, opt OptiCore is standard on this. Second, op second loop is also available. That's the back of the SD7. The cool thing about the SD7 is the SD7 has redundant engines. So if one audio engine fails, you can set it up to mirror and it will automatically switch. Um, you can switch it. It's a pre touch of a button. It has a button in the middle section of the console um, to be able to switch to the B engine. So redundancy is built into the console, which is amazing. Um, you can also get expansion chassis for the SD7 if you mixing film or something and need like a ton of faders or if you have three people who are mixing at the same time um, then you can get the expansion banks so let's talk a little bit about quantum and this carries over a little bit to now when this presentation i think i haven't received an updated presentation i'm, I'm sure gear has it which now quantum is available for the released at nam earlier this year they released the quantum 5 engine for the sd5 so that's an upgrade you can get for the sd5 but there's also now the quantum 338 which is the console that i get to sit in front of every day which is which is amazing thanks to gear audio but let's talk about quantum so if you notice the easiest way to tell is that the engine is now blue and it carries a dmi card slot in the quantum 7 so we'll talk a little bit about quantum now All right, in Quantum, we have 256 input channels, 128 output buses, but it also has 256 channels of nodal processing. Now, what nodal processing is, um, the easiest way to explain nodal processing is, let's say you're a monitor, and it's more, most commonly used at, um, at, at monitors, but let's say you have, you're at monitors and you've got, let's say you're EQing your kick drum, you EQ it to sound great, it's sounding good, but now you send it to the to the guitar player who is using Apple headphones. No, not Apple headphones. Because if you're touring with a band and you have a SD7 Quantum, they probably have decent in-ears. But let's say he's using an in-ear that's not translating the kick very well. Um, so some generic earbuds. And he says to you, well, can you add a bit, bit more low-end um, for me in my mix? Well, nodal processing allows you to process each aux separately and have separate EQ and processing on each auxiliary send on that channel. So you could essentially have a different EQ sending to each mix that you have going on. So a different each mix going to each member of the band could have a different set of EQ and processing, which is pretty cool um, and really handy for a monitor engineer. Um, it's got same amount of inputs and outputs it's got eight bnc madi connections however um and then also has ub madi built in and two dmi card slots which is which is very handy and we'll talk about why that's important um it has soundgrid io is standard for waves and optocore io is standard with the optional second loop and this is a close-up view of the of the quantum engine your DMI card slots, card slots are here, right? DMI one and two. These are your eight BNC over MADI. You have the word clock as well, your network control. This is your optical, right? And your DVI outputs for external monitors, etc. And also a part of quantum is the mustard processing. Now, the cool thing about Mustard is that Digico is working very hard to develop technology where you can move away from using external processing. Um, now, a lot of reasons why people use um, stuff like Waves is because they want model um, modelers or plugins that are modeled after um, vintage analog gear, for example. Right, So you may not be able to travel with Avalon preamps or, or compressors or Pultec EQs. So... You, you, you can purchase them at Waves and integrate them into your workflow live. Well, Mustard Processing now on the console has allowed, they've developed Mustard Processing to allow for 
for some modeling built into the console. And this is standard with Quantum. So it's included on the Quantum 338. It's on the Quantum 5 and also on the SD7 Quantum. Right? It's FPGA channel processing. It can be applied to any input or output channel strip in addition to standard processing. So you can have your standard onboard EQ, um, standard compressor and gate layered with um, mustard processing. Both standard SD and mustard processing are simultaneously available, like I just mentioned, 64 trip, strips each with three processing elements. Um, so so there, there are some preamp modelers, mustard tube preamps. Um, it, so so there, there are some built-in preamp modelers. So again, if you can afford to, say, travel around with um, some Avalons, right? There is now tube preamp modeling built into the desk. Um, there's mustard dynamics processors inspired by popular vintage analog devices based on a classic a FET optical and VCA. And, and honestly, they, for licensing reasons, they can't say exactly what these are, but the minute you pull them up on the console, you'll be able to tell, um, the type of gear that it's been modeled after. And in one of my master classes, I'll be going through mixing without plugins, which will be taking a, a deep dive into um, mustard. It's It's got mustard EQ as well, which is a four band parametric EQ plus a high pass and low pass filter, including dual all pass filters. Um, this says under development because they're working on more quote unquote plugins to release, but this is the spice rack. Um, as part of mustard processing, Spice Rack is also available on on the Quantum 338, which on the Quantum 338, you have eight um, Spice Racks. On the Quantum 7, you have 16. Um, and what these are specialty racks. So um, if you think of, they have a plugin here called Chili 6, which if you're a Waves user, you'll notice that looks very similar to C6. I don't think that can be... They can't say it, but this is a private program, so I can say it. It works very similar to C6, which is a, a essentially a, a floating band multi compressor, multi band compressor. So let's talk about the stage racks available to you. Yes, David, the mustard EQ is different from the regular channel strip EQ. It's only available on the Quantum consoles, though. Mustard EQ it sounds a little bit different and behaves a little bit different. So stage racks, and I'm trying to motor through. Hopefully you guys will stay with me. It looks like we might be a little bit longer than the hour, but I'm, I'm hoping. Drop a comment. Let me know if this is valuable, if you're getting a lot of value out of this, and I'm going to keep going through. All right. So if you look at the stage racks, you've got the, the SD racks, the line of SD racks, which has the full-size modular SD rack, the SD mini rack, and the SD nano rack. Um, all these cards, it's modular, so all these cards that you see can be replaced. You can have, I think it's um, 16, no, 7, yeah, we'll go through it in a little bit. I got to count. I have, I actually have one right in front of me. But um, yeah, they're modular IO racks. So let's talk about the SD rack. The SD racks can have... 56 a combination of 56 ins and 56 outputs um, Maddy comes standard it has a Maddy split built in with sample rate conversion and gain tracking which is phenomenal if you've ever used gain tracking on on a console nothing beats gain tracking on digital in my opinion um, I use gain tracking on tour with magic when Paulo and I are doing Paulo is a digital guy so um Whenever Paolo's out doing monitors with me, we use gain tracking and it works really, really well. And it's got optional optocore. So the one I have in front of me, um, which which we'll be going through in the masterclass, has the optocore in there. Okay, the mini rack is 32 inputs um, and or 32 outputs. Um, MADI is standard. Again, it also has the MADI split with sample rate conversion and gain tracking, and it has the optional optocore. And then the nano rack is capable of 16 inputs and or 16 outputs. Um, optocore is standard. And I'll explain why it says and or because it does carry 
depends on the cards you put in. So let's talk about the I.O. cards. It says, oh, the possibilities. Digico is English, so <laughs> the English um, phrases and puns. But you have the 32-bit um, mic preamp card, which is phenomenal. And we'll talk about why it's, it's better. I have some people who hit me up to, that seem to think that 32-bit cards don't make any difference. Well, I have news for you. It does. makes a huge difference. Um, so there is the regular 24-bit um, card, which I don't think any of the distributors are really selling those cards anymore. They, they, nowadays, the price difference is not major for you to go with 32-bit cards, and, and they make a huge difference. They also have 32-bit output cards, analog output cards. That's the 24-bit analog line output card. Um, that's the AES input card. So you can do eight channels of AES inputs for stereo pairs. You have an eight AES output card. Um, there is an AES IO card, so a bi-directional card that also has sample rate conversion. There is a AES BNC input card. There's an AES 42 input card. There's a Dante IO card that you can put into the SD Rex. And then there's a HD SDI IO card. And of course the Avium card that we talked about. So if you're in a situation where you have an Aviom system, if you're in a church um, where these are common that has an existing Aviom system, you can now um, dial in. Some of the guys watching work at the casino in Niagara Falls that have an Aviom system, you can put an Aviom card right into the SD rack and be able to assign outputs directly to the card and, and go in it out to your P16 distributor. Um, so that is available in an SD rack. All right, so let's talk about the 32-bit cards. More, more bits is better. Why is that important? So if, remember we talked about um, audio being converted from, from, from um, analog to digital, right? Um, so when, uh, what, what, what the converter is doing is it's taking an analog signal, which is essentially electricity, and it's converting it to ones and zeros. So the bits, the bit rate of the card determines how, just how many ones and zeros are, are captured in every sample, right? So a sample, whether it be at 96K, um, which I think is 96,000 samples per second, or at 48K, right? Now, the bit rate is important because the signal-to-noise ratio on a 32-bit card is a whopping 192 dB. But the information that's capture, captured per sample goes from 16 million at 24 bits to 4 billion possible integer, integer samples, integer values, sorry, per sample. Um, if you're not super technical like me, all that means is the in the conversion process from analog to digital at 32 bits, you're capturing way more information. So the information that you're hearing when it comes to you digitally, the computer is hearing way more accurate information than at 24 bits, if that makes sense. Okay. So if you look at leading competitor B versus leading competitor A versus Digico's 32 bit. Again, the, the THD plus N percent, what that is talking about is a combination of distortion and noise at 0 dB at 1K. On a 32-bit card, it is significantly less than both leading competitors, right? The dynamic range is, is more on a 32-bit card from analog to digital. 32-bit card can handle 123 dBA. Um, again, the signal to noise, the noise from analog to analog is significantly less, minus 90, right? Um, the noise analog to digital, this, this makes a big difference for you as an engineer, is minus 120 versus minus 110. So way less noise. And that's no, if you talk to people who get these 32-bit cards for the first time, that's what they notice. The 32-bit cards are a lot cleaner and they also have way more headroom. Um, 
than the 24-bit um, predecessor, okay? On the output cards, output cards is now where latency makes a big difference. And I want to start there because we already talked about max output level. That's, that's fairly standard. But take a look at this latency on from, from, from Rack IO, latency at 96K on an output card, right? Um, this is significant, especially if you're mixing monitors. Having less latency is, is way better for you as an engineer. It gives you, a, gives you a better starting point, if you will, because as you add processing, remember that's going to increase. So the cool thing about the Quantum 338 is that it now carries 32-bit I.O. cards on the surface as well. So, so you definitely, there is definitely, for those that don't think there's a difference going up to 32-bit cards, there is definitely, definitely a difference. The D-series racks. So for those of you who maybe see, these are the less expensive and not modular, um, not as modular anyway, I should say, because the D2 rack does give you two, two slots that you can put cards into. Um, but the D-series racks, you have the D2 racks. This can, you can get this either with Ethernet or BNC, Maddie. And you have the D-rack, which is only available as, as far as I know, I should say, just in case I don't want to say anything wrong, but D-Racks are available with Cat5, Maddie over Cat5. And these are commonly what you'll see with S21s or S31s. The D-Rack you'll see, some SD9s you will see with D-Racks. Um, but the D2-Rack, a lot of S21s and 31s you'll see with D2-Racks. So talk about the D-Rack. So the D-Rack has 32 mic line inputs, 16 outputs. Um, it's got built-in eight analog line outputs, and you can have put one output card expansion slot in there, which can either be analog AES or Aviom. Um, it does have, it works on Cat5e, Maddie, so I was correct. Um, and it has optional AES input modules and optional optocore. The D2 rack is a fixed I.O. rack, so it has two factory configurations. You can get it as a 48 mic line by 16 analog or a 24 mic line by 24 AES by 16 analog, okay? And it has two output card expansion slots, so you can put an analog um, output card, AES output card, or an Avium card. I believe the Avium card takes up two slots in there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, cat, and it works on either Cat5E or Coax MADI or BNC MADI as we refer to it normally. So there are more solutions for you to know about in terms of capabilities for console connectivity. This is the purple box. Um, so for example, where this purple box is used normally is if you have a MADI optical stream, not OptiCore, but MADI optical. So for example, if you want to use a UAD live rack, with your digital console, the UAD Live Rack works on MADI Optical. This is how you would convert it, convert the MADI Optical to BNC. It would be with a purple box. You have the red box. The red box is how you split D racks and D2 racks between two consoles, um, or how you convert MADI BNC to MADI Cat5, and it's USB is powered by a, by a USB plug. Um, this is how you convert MADI BNC to MADI Cat5, so the other way, but you can also use it to split D racks as well. This is the orange box. Again, it's common. The, the orange box can either do can basically do anything to anything. As long as it's in a DMI card format, the orange box takes DMI cards in it. So you can convert anything DMI to anything DMI. Um, it's 64 by 64 channel digital audio format converter. It's modular card based, based on DMI cards, as I said, and it does have redundant power supplies. So DMI stands for digital multi-channel interface, and there's a few options for DMI cards. So we'll talk about that. There is the AES option, analog input, analog output. There's an Aviom DMI card. There's Dante, Hydra 2, um, just you name it, there's a ton of DMI card options. The AMM is the automatic automatic mixer, which is similar to how a Dugan works. 
and there's the A3232, which is the new technology for the 4A4, um, 4 Area 4 technology that they have, which we'll talk about a little bit. So the automatic microphone mixer, um, 64 channels of automatic mic mixing. Um, this is available on the SD7 Quantum and 12 only. Well, that's there's a correction to that because it is now available on the um, 5 and the Quantum 338. And it does 48 channels of automatic mic mixing on the S21 or S31. Um, automatic mic mixing is cool if you're in a corporate environment. Um, you can't, Rigel, I see your question. You can use OptiCore on an orange box. In fact, that is how Pitbull um, converts optical to MADI for use with his, um, with his Waves LV1. So everything is running an optical loop and the optical gets into the orange box and is then converted to BNC MADI for his Waves LV1. So the orange box can use OptiCore, yes. Um, so where was I? Automatic mic mixing, yes. Very, very convenient, um, especially in corporate scenarios. Um, the A3232 is a new is a new format for the four area four system, which we'll talk about now. Um, it's 96k, 32 in and 32 out per port, so you can do 64 total, um, up to 100 meters between devices, and it works on unshielded Cat5 e cabling. So what's four area four? Um, this is really cool. Let's say if you work in a, I, I think about churches automatically when I think about this. So if you're in a church that has a multi-room facility, so maybe you have a youth sanctuary, a kid sanctuary, you send a feed to an overflow room um, when, you, when you're fu um, full, when the house is full, um, or you have like a room for nursing mothers where you want to send a feed um, of the surface. Four area four is perfect for that. So it comes with, this is kind of the brains of the operation, um, which we'll get into a little bit, into a little bit now. It's got four zones or areas, right? Each with dedicated stereo masters, um, um, left and right and solo, right? It can do 128 input channels. Um, and, and any surface, any digital surface can connect to a four area four system. So if you have, you can use the surface of your choice. Um, this is just the engine that drives the four area four and you can connect the stage racks that we talked about before to this system, right? Um, it's got 512 by 512 point to point router. It does 48 auxes, groups, matrix effects. Um, 96K, like I said, it's got four DMI IO cards, three SD IO card slots, okay, built into the to the engine, um, and it it you can add remote IP or um, which is power over Ethernet controllers. It's got macros on it, um, and it's got a Mac and PC iPad app. Now there are different controllers that you can connect to this system. So let's say this is this is for the for the guys who do church stuff or multi room stuff. Uh, you got a venue that has multiple rooms. This is pretty cool. Because let's say you got a nursery that you're sending a feed of your main mix from your main room to, right? This can be set up on the wall. You can assign a bus to it. So it could be like a matrix off of your left and right of your console. And then this would be a volume control for that room, right? So a single rotary um, switch controller, right? This dual mode. Um, <clears throat> fader or source select. So you can select the source right from the controller here. So you could also have multiple sources. I mean, it only does one at a time, but you could have multiple sources going in there. So you could change the source. Let's say maybe in the room you have a feed coming in, but you also have playback music um, for quiet time for the kids or whatever. If, you, if it's a nursery, for example, you can actually change the source. Um, level name, mute and solo indication. Um, it's it's the size of a light switch essentially, and it's powered over Ethernet, which is pretty cool. Um, the step up from that is the Area Control Six. Okay, that has six rotary uh, um, slash switch controllers, twelve switch controllers, uh, dual mode, so normal and shift. If you push it, six bank selectors, so you could have six different things in that room. So let's say you had a conference room in the church that had some local inputs in that room. So let's say you had a computer playback, 
playback from a TV, playback, um, listening from a web conferencing system. Maybe you had a mic input on the wall and then you had a feed from the main service. You, you could put this, this is wall mountable um, and it can be powered over ethernet or have a 12 volt um, PSU for power. This is the area control eight, which again is just an expansion of the six, but with eight moving faders for control, not just the knobs. And then these are the stage boxes that work with the area 16, um, the area four area four system. This is the A168 stage box. It's got 16 mic line inputs, eight line outs, um, 32. It works on the 32 by 32 protocol. Um, you, it's, you can either have them redundant or you can daisy chain them. And it's, and it's got in, indicators for 48 volts and it works um, all the way up to 240 volts PSU for those of you in areas that use 240 volts. This is the A164 wall um, plate. So again, if you're in a in a if you've got a conference room, let's say in the church, and you want to put a wall uh, a, a wall plate in um, just to be able to do different inputs, it's got an LCD, so you can actually label it. Um, it's available with or without the LCD, but obviously um, having the ability to label what those inputs are, um, you can use this in combination with uh, with the the eight, the eight control eight or the eight control six. So again, very, very handy for churches that have multi-room operations with Digico at the core. And then this is the A star, which is the multiplex combiner, um, which you can now use um, for for A thirty two thirty two ports. Okay. It also you can also use GPIO. Um, relays. So let's say you want to use a GPI bio relay to turn on your um, projector or maybe things like if you have, like in certain venues, they have a requirement for if the fire alarm goes off, it cuts your audio, mutes your audio. That's what you would do with a GPI or relay. And these are some examples. So performance venues. So let's say for the guys from the casino, let's say you could have a four area four system with your stage racks. So this is your front of house console, monitor console, all in that loop. So all the inputs are are there and then you could assign now a matrix out. So let's say you have a dressing room that had a area control one. Um, you had backstage, you had uh, a foyer. There, the bar could select certain things, also have playback. So at the bar, let's say if they've got a bar that's in a separate room and, and you have a playback input that's separate from what's going on inside the, the, the performance area, there's just so many things you can do. And then you could have other rooms. The, the system is actually incredible. Um, you can also use it for audio matrixing. Um, if you have, let's say, guest consoles or or whatever the case might be and and you can use a audio control 8 so um you you could have multiple consoles connected to to an area 4 system and be able to to mute them so this would be like in the case of like a let's say a festival situation where you have guest consoles coming in um it can also be used for that house of worship we talked about um so like if you have like i said an infant area overview overflow area a youth area and then a backstage area. There's so much you can do um, with this system to 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 do that. And then you have your front of house and your monitor console and theater. Just more examples. So let's talk a little bit about Clang. So obviously, I'm a big Clang user and a and a big supporter of what they're doing with Clang. I do have a webinar um, coming up. Yeah, Brian, we definitely should talk a little bit about the Area 4 Area 4 system for the casino for sure. Um, so I do, I am a Clang user. I have a webinar coming up with Phil, so stay tuned to my pages because um, I'll be announcing that, so I'll be doing some stuff with Clang. Um, but what Clang is, is is a professional monitoring system. It's natural immersive mix mixing or what we refer to as binaural Um so listening the way you're meant to listen, not um, especially when using in ears. Um, it's got digital the the Fabrique system. All of this has now been replaced with uh, uh, the DMI card, which it is now the DMI card is able to do 56 channels. I, I mean, sorry, 64 inputs. 
um, this says up to 56, but the, the, the DMI card um, is able to do 64 inputs with 16 stereo um, immersive mixes um, at 96K. So it's way powerful than a Clang Fabrique. Um, but this was prior to the DMI card, this was what was available. So again, I just spoke about that a little bit. Um, the Clang Veer is, is uh, um, five musicians on this one, and it's and it's Dante. Okay, this is the the Clang Quell, which is the Dante headphone amplifier. So you can send these mixes mixes to this unit um, via Dante, and of course, it's all controlled via Clang OS. Um, I won't get into much detail on this because, again, I'll be doing a webinar for Clang, and I'll also be doing a masterclass on how to use it. Um, but I would suggest you go and download the Clang Clang OS. Um, just go to the the App Store on your phone or your computer, and you can download it. It has a demo mode. Um, you can put it in demo, and it has some multi tracks in there that you can play around with and see how it works. But it is phenomenal. Um, the cool thing about Clang is now it's integrated um, into the console, so um, you can you can control the unit um, from the console, which was which is very important to workflow. So we'll talk a little bit about um, overview. We there's there's um, in all in these consoles that are listed here. There's also a broadcast version of it um, and a theater version of the nine, ten, and seven. Um, the SD ten theater version is actually very very um, popular, and and the main the main difference is how it handles um, snapshots. So let's talk a little bit about um, BNC MADI versus like Cat5. Um, BNC MADI can run 56 or 64 channels at 48K and 28 or 32 at 96K, right? Either standard MADI or MADI 64, right? Um, you use 75 ohm coax cable, right? It can run up to 328 feet comfortably. Um, it's unidirectional interface, so you, you need to have a send and receive right um 24 bit pcm audio right um with negligible latency right um on the ethernet ethernet um is only 56 channels um at 48k and 28 channels at 96 right um and and still you don't want to be running more than 328 feet we we set all our ethernet snakes to max 300 feet so we're not getting close to that 328 um when you talk about sound grid um, 128 channels at 48 or 96, um, 0.8 milliseconds round trip latency, um, but it must pass through a certified um, gigabit switch. And those are for Waves um, is, is listed on the Waves website for SoundGrid. OptiCore is 504 channels at 48 or 96 per, per loop. Um, you can daisy chain, you can have redundant loop com, um, configurations, which is important, right? You got multi mode. 450 meters per per hop single mode um like we discussed earlier is like never ending basically um you can get a hma st or optical con right which is a special order um, most people are using hma extended beam okay on opticore you can have five consoles per single optical loop um plus redundant engines you can have 14 sd SD mini, SD nano, or D racks or orange boxes in a single optical loop. We'll talk about why that's important. We have 504 channel inputs um, and outputs per optical loop. 56 channels of virtual sense per console. All surfaces see all inputs. Um, can control mic pre, or you can set it to receive only. So you can have one master and have the rest receive. Output can be assigned to any console on, on a card by card basis. So you can't assign individual outputs it has to be done that that card has to be assigned to that console right so if you look at system examples so so let's say um you you take uh you you take let's say something like uh uh the grammys or a big award show so you have front of house music which is id one and two which is dealing with all your music musical acts 
you have front of house production which is dealing with all your like mcs um djs anything that's playing playback in between acts whatever is all coming through your production console then you have two monitor consoles because you're going back and forth act to act this could also be in a festival situation too this doesn't have to be like a large award show and then you have a broadcast console well in digital world all those consoles can share all the input racks so let's say you have now for patching sake um you have a ton of sd racks right and it's going to take a while to come up to to give you the effect we should have like cinematic music playing back behind this like so you can see right so you have eight sd racks let's say every band that's playing is patched on a different sd rack that's in loop right and then you got some some um mini racks or nano racks these are mini racks let's say for for local outputs of each console right um or some local inputs like each engine each console can have one of those mini racks for like its own playback and then you can run that back into a loop so that creates an entire system all consoles see all racks all the inputs and can be set up to control gain or just receive so let's say you set your you can set your monitors as your masters and and set these to receive only your front of house production and broadcast to receive so they would only have trim but it would also gain track from your monitor console so you wouldn't have to worry about levels changing during your show phenomenal this is what they do on like the grammys and and the oscars and big shows right and then on the second loop you can add a second loop for each console so that's just one loop right but then each console can have also have it's a second loop with with its own set of sd racks and nano racks and everything else if you wanted to let's say run redundancy right so you could have you could essentially have loop a and then using a split so you could patch into to multiple at once like it's it's crazy the the possibilities that you can do on optical or you can have on all you can have both loops running to all consoles for the ultimate redundancy like um it's actually quite incredible what you can do so let's say you you wanted to so if you wanted to run two stage boxes to an sd10 because again it's capable of 144 inputs you can do 56 per sd rack right so you can run it on maddie coax or you can do standard optical right where where it's where it's going back and forth right and then you jump it out to the second rack and back in so you create a loop like that or you could do hma optical and create just one loop so basically how that works is you would go out of a up from the console into b on the on the stage rack then out of a into b on here or yeah into b on here and then out of b back in to the disc so you'd create a loop did i say that right no so out of a into b out of a into b and then out of a into b back into b so you create one loop right with hma optical that's how it's done and i think this just shows that so that that's your a and that's your b on the hma optical these are your madi ports on the back right so you can connect via standard madi again if you're running 48k you would only need um one pair of madi if you're running 96 you need two so you would have to it would be four coax um cables to to go to each rack if you're running 96k that's your waves card um your waves io card for sound grid that's your network port on the console that's your word clock in and out all right so this is what the madipod looks like on the sd rack right so that's your MADI main for, for coax MADI. That's your MADI aux. So again, you can you can use um if if you're running 96k, that's that's what you if you'll notice here, I hope you can read that. 96k, the MADI main is carrying channel 1 to 28, and the aux is carrying 29 to 56. Right? So at 96k, you need all four. And then 
but you can also do a split to a console at 96k and do receive only so what this is is only the out of the rack to the in of the console and that console that is now the the secondary console would not have gain but it would receive all the inputs with the ability to trim and gain track from the same sd rack all 56 channels all right so that's your MADI split like i talked about if you're sharing a stage rack between two consoles that's your word clock in and out again now that's only if you want to clock externally or sometimes in a broadcast scenario that somebody else might be sending you clock um but the console takes the clocking through the MADI ports like the sd rack will clock through the ports from the console and vice versa that's your optocore all right so if you wanted to use two you you can use two d racks with uh again because the the sd9 will do 96 inputs so you could use two d racks or two d2 racks um, you can share a d rack between two consoles using the little red box right um this console whether it be monitors or front of house whichever fits your workflow would have full gain control which would be the audio sync master so this one would be sending your clock right and then this one would be set to take external sync through the cat5 port which is where you would assign it in the audio sync on the console you can do two two um DRACs with the same configuration because the the SD9 has two Cat5 ports. An SD10 with a D2 rack or an SD8, sorry, in that picture with a D2 rack, you can do Coax MADI to do 48K. Again, if you wanted to do 96K, you'd have to run two sets of Coax MADI. Um, or you can run two stage boxes at 48K. You can again do gain tracking and, and, and share a stage box. So for the SD8 to have full control, you would run both unidirectional in and out. And then the SD9, which would be your B console, would take an out from the stage rack to the in of, of that disk. On the D2 rack, if you're sharing a D2 rack, you can only do 48K. You won't be able to do you won't get all the inputs if you're doing 96 again because to do 96 you'd have to run two pairs of bnc um same thing here madi coax you can do two sd racks to an S, uh, sd10 and then take this madi split out of the sd rack to a second sd10 so let's talk a little bit about waves all right so um, on version 987 and later on the SD series console, Waves has now been the control of Waves. It's integrated, but it's not hosted on the console, I believe is the correct way to, to, to explain that. So there's a Waves DMI card that goes into the SD12. There is a approved gigabit switch. So I have a Netgear switch that's like $100 that I use, which is the uh, one of the approved switches. It's an eight port switch. You can you use a sound grid server. You can also use a redundant server if you choose. A computer to host it, so it can either be your lap, laptop or or like a Mac Mini or uh, Intel Nook PC. You need a computer to to host the sound grid program. Everything gets connected to the switch. So this one here is the from the network port of the console. There's a, a network cable from the Waves DMI card. There's one that goes to the computer and one that goes to the server or to the redundant server if you have redundant servers. And you can hook up a touch screen, let's say to your computer or if it's your laptop, right? And it has full console integration. So you'll be able to cons control the SoundGrid um, program from your your console with the touch turn button okay sd convert software let's talk a little bit about that um if you scan this um qr what is what is it called qrc code or whatever it's called <laughs> if you scan this little barcode it will take you to the download of sd convert 
Um, this is how you convert software um, from each console so the 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 the, the files are interchangeable but um, they they have to be converted so you can't take an sd7 file and simply just load it on an sd5 you would have to convert it but it's very easy to use you click load session select your session um, in that then you select the destination console here so if you're going to an SD11 or now there's one available to go to a Quantum 338, you select your destination, um, go through the channel list and click the sources you will not be using. So if you're, let's say you're going from an SD7 to an 11, you will see some stuff appear in red because the SD7 obviously has way more channels than an SD11. So you'll have to go through and deselect the sources you won't be using. And once and and all the channels, once all the channels have a check mark, everything comes up green. Um, you can save the session here up at the top with a new file name. Now the key is you cannot go from newer SD convert to old console software. You can only go from old to new. So so on the on the Quantum three three eight for example, the software is now at twelve point zero point one two two nine. Um, you cannot go back in time. You can only go forward. So if you had a 967 file, let's say, you could go to a 1143 file. But you can't go from an 1143 to, to an older file. So usually what I suggest is when you're advancing the show, make sure that the, the company that's providing the console has it updated to the latest version of the firmware. Setting up your session, there's different parts to setting up a session. There's session structure, options, sorry. Let me go back to that. Sync audio IO on your channel list, right? So let's talk a little bit about, about session structure. There's default structure, custom structure where you can customize how, how the console gets set up. Um, this is where you deal with loading and saving sessions, partial loading, all that stuff, session compatibility, SD convert right? Um, so it's important that you do this first when you're setting up a session, when you're building a session from scratch, because you want to tell the console, this is where you tell the console what, what sample rate to use for the file, whether 48K or 96K, right? Um, this is where you set up how many input channels you want, how many aux buses, how many group buses, how many, ma um, well, you can't change the amount of matrix inputs, but if you, if let's say you want to clear a file, this is where you would do it. This is where you um, order your groups, or set the order of your auxes. Um, you can clear waves from here. You can clear all your snapshots. Session structure is a really um, handy tool. Um, you can default all. So this is where you return a console to its default state. That's in session structure, right? The next thing you want to look at is, is fixing your options. So when I'm building a file, I start with my session structure. I then go to my options and make sure the desk is behaving how I want it to behave. So there's a few different tabs under under options, and you can look at this on the external. Um, the offline editor is the exact same as the console. So if you view the offline editor, it will look the same. Um, and this is where you can set up your console to operate the way you want it to operate. Um, then you got to deal with sync. You got to make sure once you set up your console that you have sync with your stage racks. Right, and also that your clocking is set correctly. And then you set up your audio I.O. So when you go to the audio I.O. page, right, this is where you're able to, to tell the console what the racks are doing, which port they're in, and how they should behave, essentially. So if, you, if, you, if you're using MADI to connect to a D2 rack, as it says here, or a SD rack, you select the device type in the pull-down menu and confirm. So the first thing you want to do is, um, usually when I walk up to a brand new console, if I'm building a file on a console, you want to hit confirm, conform all ports. Once you conform all ports, it will show you all the ports of the console, um, audio I.O. ports of the console on the left side. So let's say you go and click on rack one, for example. Um, you want to tell it the device type. So this is where you would select SD rack, right? And then where it's connected, right? If you're using OptiCore, um, as it says here, if you're using OptiCore to connect to an SD rack, orange box are similar. Change these ports to standard MADI or MADI 64 and confirm. Do not delete these ports even if you are not using MADI connections. You don't want to delete any of your ports. You just change them to something that you're not using. 
If you're using optical, it, it will when you hit this drop down menu, you will see um, you will see the optical IDs. You got just got to select the ID that matches the rack or assign the rack to the ID that you're using. Okay. So your local I/O, right? Um, you can you can change the, you can do listen, right? Which is kind of your line check mode, right? Where you can listen directly to the ports versus having to go through faders if you're just line checking, and you can adjust set gain there, right here. Not just for local I/O. This is just line check mode on the console. You can actually click on the port here. Or the 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 in that that connector in that card, so that XLR port, let's say that that would be channel one on your SD rack. If you click on that, it opens this, and you can listen to it for line check. So this is how you put the console in line check mode if you're working on a festival and you don't you have to line check without the PA on. Virtual sound check. That's that's another part. That's um a big part of what we do nowadays. You can copy audio. So the copy audio feature, there's two ways of doing this. You can either copy from the rack. So if all your inputs are on one stage rack, the easiest way to do it is copy audio to, let's say you're using MADI 1 or the USB port. If you're using the MADI, if the, you're using the built-in UB MADI, if you're on an SD12 Quantum 3385 or 7, um, then you can copy it directly to the USB because your USB will show up in your audio I port, IO ports. Um, and then it's sending the information from this rack, which is my rack 1.11 ID, would be sending all the inputs right off the head amp to MADI, um, the, the, my one, this MADI input, which is my, let's say a DigiGrid MGB or uh, UB MADI or whatever my RME MADI face, any MADI interface, right? And then to bring it back into the console, I simply click listen to copied audio and it brings it back to the console for virtual sound check right into the head amp. This is how this page you can, which is if you go to um, setup, underneath setup, there is a copy audio tab. This is where you now can decide, like if you did it the way I was telling you before with just copying here, it's gonna send it one to one, but maybe you don't wanna record it one to one. Maybe you want your, you wanna set up a matrix of how it sends to the record. This is where you would do it in your copy audio page. And with copy audio, you can copy from any of your ports to any of the ports. So there's a from section and where it's going. And you can also select listen to copy audio here to bring it back into the console for virtual sound check. Okay, this is a UB MADI interface. Again, the UB MADI is now built in on the SD12, on the Quantum 5, Quantum 7, and the Quantum 338. There's 48 channels at 48K, MADI to USB. So um, it plugs into your computer into one of your USB ports um, and it carries core audio and ASIO drivers. Um, and like I said, it's built in on the S21, S31, 12, Quantum 7, Quantum 5 and 338 as well. This is the DigiGrid MGB. I own one of these really handy unit. It does 128 channels at 48K or 64 channels at 96. Now it's important to know if you're doing 96K and you want all 64 channels, you need to hook up all four BNC ports. If you want 128 channels at 48K, you need all four. Each pair of BNC ports carries 64 channels at 48K or 32 channels at 96. You can also use a DigiGrid MGB to go to multi com multiple computers at the same time because it works on the SoundGrid network, which runs through an approved switch. All right, so this is, um, again, how you use MADI coax to set this up. Again, with one set of MADI coax cables, you'd only be able to do 64 channels at 48K or 32 at 96. But if you use the optical loop to do your SD racks, then you would have all available coax MIDI ports to be able to do a full 128 channels at 96K available to you. you like I said, you can use um, SoundGrid, uh, you can use the DigiGrid MGB um, 
to go to multiple computers for tracking um, through the SoundGrid network. So you can you can have multiple computers track off the same disk um, if you wanted to have redundancy or or so forth, so on and so forth. Okay, you can also do that with the Waves DMI or SoundGrid port. Or vice versa, you can have one computer feed multiple consoles. So if you have one recording computer um, in a touring setup, um, you could you could essentially um, feed multiple consoles for, for virtual sound check or some sort of broadcast situation, anything. So you can use the MGB with SoundGrid that way. That is set up in SoundGrid IO um, or Wave SoundGrid Studio, which um, this is now built into Super Rack. So if you're using Super Rack, this looks very similar in Super Rack. Um, this is where you would set up and patch um, your inputs and outputs um, to an MGB if you're using the SoundGrid network. And this is where you control it. So if you hit on the, the settings, so in in SoundGrid Studio or Super Act, there's a little settings um, gear right here. If you click that, it will open this page, which is where you decide where the um, clocking is happening. So the source, um, your clock source, sample rate, sample rate mode, and it shows you if the sync is okay, right? And sync over Ethernet is only available on some of the consoles. Layout channel list. This is where you can edit quickly edit channel names. So if you were to click this little drop down here, it would show you this menu. And if you click edit, you can simply click on this space and tab to the next one, then to the next one, then to the next one. Um, so that's where you would quickly edit input channel names. You can also select layer and bank that it goes on here. There's also another way um, to assign fader banks. If you go to um, layout, there's a layout tab on the console. And if you click layout tab, below that it says fader banks. And this is where you would assign fader banks. And in our advanced class, we'll talk about custom banks um, as we go through. So if we look at input channels, this is what the input channel looks like on an SD series console. Once you select a channel, it turns brown. It's laid out very much like an analog disk. So at the top is your preamp. Um, if it's if it's connected to like a MADI feed, for example, it would just it will show blue as trim. But if you connect it to an actual socket on a head amp, so on an SD rack, it will show as red. Um, you have your aux section, which is grayed out. But let's go through it in detail. Right once you select it, so you select the channel. The top is your head amp and filters inserts. EQ is next, then your compression, gate, and then your aux section, and then the output section of that fader, of that input strip, which has your panning, and also where you do your group assigns is on the lowest point of your fader. So again, that's preamp, insert A, EQ, dynamic one, which is usually a compressor, or we'll go through that in a section. In a, sec in a second, sorry, dynamic two, insert B, your aux sends again, and your bus routing direct out channel labeling. Okay. So many choices with your channels. Again, your channel, you can assign your channel to be, uh, it can be a mono channel, um, left and right, um, or it can be a LCR. You can make it a stereo channel. You can make it 5.1. Um, so many options, so many choices. Um, from live sound guys, most of the time, it's going to be either a mono or stereo channel um, in left, right, unless you have an LCRPA. And everything remains the same. The channel layout is never going to be different. The panning section might look different, but um, yeah. All right, so when you select at the top, when if you if you click, if you press this top section of the console, it will open this menu, which is your channel setup tab. And that's where you'd select if it's a mono channel, stereo channel, or if you want to create a multi-input channel, which is also possible. A multi-input strip, I should say. 
sorry okay so this is where this is your channel control um, in here below here this is your delay um, maybe this brings it up so you can also select main input or alternate input which comes in really handy for example um, if you're if you're if you have a lead vocal that has a main mic and a, a, a spare vocal you can have both those inputs on one strip and switch between both right um, below that if you make it a stereo channel you will see this pop-up which is balance and width below that is your input routing so this is where you're selecting where it's coming from this is delay um, to your to your like you can delay your inputs obviously most digital consoles do that below that is digitube and what that is is adding a little bit of analog sort of like tape warmth um, tube warmth to your input channel and most all SD consoles have this digitube feature you can label it here you can also set your channel safes if you wanted to copy your channel to another channel or from another channel this is where you would do it you can also load presets if you have presets saved and this is where you would select if it's assigned to solo one or solo two depending on if you're using multiple solo buses that's also possible this is your EQ section again with Digico think about it as if you want something you touch it it's gonna pop up so if you touch the EQ section this pops up first and then you can touch this section to expand the screen okay um, your EQ also has um, dynamic EQ and this is where you access dynamic EQ you select these little this little section here and it opens a pop-up to your left to the left of the EQ strip which is your dynamic EQ um, that's how you can control sometimes a singer's um, EQ or tone changes if they're laying into the mic if you're mixing rock and you got a singer that screams then you might want to use dynamic EQ for when he's louder have a different EQ for when he uh, have the bass EQ for when he's singing normally and then if he screams you have a different dynamic EQ this is your dynamic section so again if you press the dynamics this pops up um, your compressor can either can be one of three things it can be a compressor and if you press it again it um, opens up this expanded view um, you have two dynamics built in on the desk compressor can either be a standard compressor a multiband compressor or a de -esser. Um and and then below that you can either have a gate docker or uh, another compressor you can have a second compressor if you do a multi-stage compression or whatever you might want to do there um, on your output section so at the bottom of your fader which is where it, which is the output section of the fader now um, this is where you assign groups so you can assign a channel to either a mono group or a stereo group you can assign direct outs here as well and you can also access your inserts from here insert a and b and if it's a send you can send it out to an fx preset at that point external integration so we talked about um, different things that can be externally integrated into the desk this is where you would do it under setup you go to external control and this window opens and this is where you can set up for example if you want to use an iPad wirelessly to control your console for whatever reason um, this is where you would do that right and and then you can do stuff like um, spatial audio processing which is like Elisa um, from L acoustics is integrated right into the console so your panner if you'll notice the panner changes once Elisa is is activated for those particular channels once external control is selected and it actually affects what's happening in the Elisa Elisa processor right same thing with Clang Clang is integrated fully into Digico so um, Clang allows you to do what's called merge inputs on an aux master so you merge the input back from Clang so it's listening to the aux sends coming back from Clang 
And again, in a masterclass, we'll do how to set it up properly. But once that external control is set up properly, um, when you click on a uh, aux that has Clang enabled, this guy appears and you can control Clang, the panning, as well as the send level, as well as the vertical orientation as well, right from the console. So we're coming to the end, guys. Hang in there with me. Hopefully you're enjoying this. Hopefully this is good. Um, so this is what your aux looks like. Again, um, um, looks very similar. If you want it, if an aux versus a stereo aux and then a, a, a group versus a stereo group, you have to go into session structure and, and, and select how many mono slash stereo auxes or groups you want ahead of time. So this is not like an input channel where you can just go to the top and tell it to be a stereo channel. You have to actually go into um, session structure and select this ahead of time. Okay, and when you click the um, the top setup section of an aux master, right, this is where you set up your aux. So if you click that top section, it opens this drop down. Um, you can change a bunch of stuff in here. And again, guys, this is available if you if you download the offline editor, then you can come back to this video and watch it. Um, I'm going to leave this up. So this is where you would select the merge input for for Clang to come back in. Um, this is where you can select your aux to be pre-mute, pre-fader, post-fader, inputs only. Um, all of that stuff is right here in the setup of your aux channel. Okay, aux sends to faders. I won't go through this because basically, um, I I when I'm running monitors, I in the options I can select solo to to do aux sends to fader automatically. So I won't spend a lot of time on that because that's how I run the console. This is your solo buses, so you can change your solo from mono if you're doing like a q wedge you can change that to mono um you can select here when there's no solo what you're hearing so i like to hear when i'm doing monitors for shaggy i have shaggy's mix set as my no solo so when i'm not listening to anything like when i don't have anything soloed it defaults to shaggy's mix right and you can select it to go direct out. I usually assign my solo buses into a matrix so that I can also matrix in talkback mics as well. But this is where your this is your solo control panel. Groups look a lot like oxes, just a different color. Oxes are purple, groups are brown. So we talked about that. This is your matrix input page. So if you go to your master screen of your console and select matrix, this is where you would assign inputs that are going into the matrix that you can now dial into your matrix outputs. So when you think about matrices or matrices or however you correctly say it in English, <laughs> um, you think about an input and an output where it's going. So you can do, I think on the quantum 338, you can do 24 matrix inputs and 24 outputs. So I would select what I want to put in. So normally, um, if I'm doing front of house, this would be left. This would be right, and then I can dial it into matrix one, which is left, right, sub. I dial in both left and right. Um, it's important if you're going to use your left and right matrix, um, digital console sum at minus six. So if you dial, if you want to dial like a left and right and have it sum to zero, you would dial both these knobs to minus six, and it would sum to zero. <clears throat> so that's important to know if you're dialing a left and right into matrices to use for, let's say, front fills or delay fills or you don't have an external processor. So you're doing delay timing off the console. You always want to sum at you want to dial your left and right in at minus six to sum to zero. Does that make sense? This is your matrix master. So the output side, once you dial it in, you come here. And you can patch your outputs where that matrix is going down at the bottom section of your matrix master. All right, guys. Well, that is all I have for you today. Um, we are going to be doing a um, master class. One of my master classes that are scheduled is a digital training 
uh, masterclass. But definitely, if you scan that that whatever Q code thing is, um, it will take you to some training links and and there's stuff that you can download from a Dropbox link and be able to go into more in depth training. Um, if you haven't already done so, please um, go check out my Patreon site, patreon.com slash Jason Reynolds Pro Audio. Um, this coming Tuesday, we have um, Drew Keys coming back to do an Ableton Masterclass. And then the following Tuesday is when we'll be doing our digital advanced training. So we're going to teach you how to set up the console from scratch, everything to look for, QR code. Thank you. Thank you, Dev. I'm not that technical. But anyway, yeah, scan that QR code right now, and it will take you to, to where you can access some more training information from Digicode directly. Um, thank you to Gear Audio for, for sponsoring my channel. Thank you to Digico for providing this slide presentation and allowing me to do this. Um, I had to go through a little bit of quote-unquote testing with Jeff today to make sure that I was going to do a good job of it. But, um, yeah, let's take a few questions. Um, if you got, if you all got questions, drop them in the comments right now before I got to get off in, like, I got maybe about nine more minutes. We can take a few questions. So let me know if you have any questions. Let's take a few before we jump off today. If we don't have any questions, then we'll we'll call it a day. Um, but thanks for joining, guys. Please please go opt in at the website, jasonreynoldsproaudio.com. Dav just dropped the Patreon site in there. Um, the master classes are phenomenal. Like the guys on here that are are subscribed to the master classes will tell you they are amazing. Like I don't leave out anything. I give you all the secrets. I'm not one of those guys who are just going to tell you a piece. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you everything. So we've been sharing everything in our master classes, um, and they have truly been phenomenal. So if we have no questions, I don't see any questions coming through. So I feel like maybe we've covered everything that is needed to be covered today. Y'all good? Everything good? Let me know. Going once. Going twice. And gone. No question. So we're gonna call it call it call it a day. But yeah, thank you guys for um thanks for tuning in to another one. Learn from the pros. Tomorrow is gonna be great. My good friend Ash, um, stage manager extraordinaire, extremely experienced. He's done some of the biggest festivals in America and around the world, and he also works with us for Kaya Fest. He's an integral part of our team. He's a stage manager. He's the stage manager for Kaya Fest. So I'm excited about talking to Ash tomorrow, so make sure you tune in. And um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for your support, guys, and thanks for tuning in today, and have a great evening.